here and find out. <laughs> well, the company would not help me. I had a recoilage rifle in there. I ordered put a thermite in it and destroy it and throw it in the rice paddy. And we broke out of that ambush, carried by dead. What I saw today was exactly that. This is later than the fire. A grenade went off about a foot above my chest. And fortunately, I was wearing a, an experimental flak vest. Here comes a little bitty black kid that was a private and grabbed me and he drug me down that hill backward and they put me against the wall. Eventually, a corpsman came and said, this man I think's alive. They put me on a stretcher and tied me down, put me in what I later thought was a cop. And they tied that cop on a mass helicopter. I was floating in the air. And I said to myself, I died and gone to heaven. Then all of a sudden, I heard this terrible noise. And then I tried to move and I couldn't move. And I said, oh my God, I've died and gone to hell. <laughs> And all of that hit me today, and hopefully it helps me to resolve. I have nightmares every night because of the people that died under my command. I joined the Navy 17 days before the Korean War started. And he said, you're going to get Corbin once we were set to go. We had our white arm bands with a red cross, one on each arm. Our helmets had a white circle here on the front, one on this side, one on this side, with a red cross in front of them. We had we been trained to use the carbine. They took them away from us. They said the Geneva Convention says you're non-combatants. You cannot have a weapon. Well, we left San Diego for the ship. We were out about, oh, three miles, four miles out from San Diego. Chief came by and says, give me your armbands. Took them all off. He tossed them overboard. <laughs> and uh, he said, here's some Marine Corps green paint. Paint your helmets. So he painted up the targets. Those were tremendous targets on those helmets in those days. And we painted them out. And he said, okay, go gather your carbines. And so we went off in Korea. We looked like a Marine, and we felt like one. I remember my first day in landing in Korea. It was cold. I think it was about 25 below. They were out digging up mines. And before I'd been there 24 hours, I had my first casualty. The hardest thing I ever did, and the colonel mentioned this when he said, they parked him against the wall and forgot about him. It sounded like somebody triaged him and said he's not going to live. We met those little Bell helicopters he talked about. He wasn't sure what he was flying in. But that's just like the chopper they used in the movie MASH. And it was my job to triage these guys coming in. Look at the wounds to say what can we do? Can we get you up and operating? Can we get you in enough shape to go back to the hospital ship? Or do we put you in the corner and give you morphine? And make you happy, happy, happy. Because there was nothing more we could do for you. These I still dream about. As to how many. And it's been 60 years now. Every once in a while I wake up in a dead sweat. Thinking I'm still in that situation. Right now I'm feeling it. I felt it when I saw the Korean. One, I spent almost a year with combat engineers in that garb, carrying my medical kit, patching up guys, running out of minefields, 
and they would do anything to protect their form. I got parked many times behind a big rock, behind a big tree, or anything that would protect me. But the platoon sergeant said, I want you around in case I get hit. You have towers uh, that you jump out of to get the uh, to learn how to exit the aircraft in uh, in a certain position, so that uh, your shoe will not tangled up with your feet and your boots and whatever. So then they put us up on a 250 foot tower and they race you up there. And my friend quit right there and then. So they punished him. So he was shipped out to Korea and I stayed. I, I made jump school. So I told the priest, I said, he says, what seems to be the problem, son? I said, I want to go to confession, but I want to tell you, priest, I don't want to kill anybody. He says, what do you mean you don't want to kill anybody, son? You're, this is a war. My weapon destroys a lot of people, and I don't want to kill anybody. I will absolve you, son. I will. You, it's either you or the enemy. Two or three months, and uh, having people fire at me, all the artillery coming at us and everything, I changed my mind. I said, yeah, I don't know, I, they're right, I gotta, I gotta defend myself. This one time, uh, it was a night, and uh, my company commander had, uh, uh, they killed my company commander and my platoon leader, and uh, a private by the name of uh, Private Williams, which I always pray for them because I, I always remember them. especially the Korean uh, Memorial. I could see myself on one of the soldiers. Uh, I felt it was very moving and very touching because it, that's the way we were. That's the way we were. And uh, as we were coming back, Gloria said, look at the wall. I seen a friend of mine, McNeil, who didn't make it back. And that was him. And uh, I didn't know what to say when I seen him. It's very moving, very touching, very, emotional. My best friend and I were on the end of the line to prevent anybody from coming around and being behind our front line. We stayed there for about two days, if I remember right. And about the second day, they would disperse and come charging. And it was pretty much of a nightmare to hold them back. I often thought about, geez, we're gonna run out of ammo. I asked Bruce, I says, do you have any hand grenades left? Yeah, I have one, and that's the same number I had. So I took the two hand grenades, laid on my belly, and scooted down to the knoll. I asked Bruce to inform the machine gunners that were behind us and above us, please don't shoot me. I didn't want to die that way. Not afraid of dying, I didn't really care, but I didn't want to go that way. When I got down to the knoll, a new group of troops had moved in to the position on the other side of the knoll. And before they came up, I laid one of the hand grenades down in amongst them. And before the noise of the first grenade was gone, I laced it with the second one. I immediately turned around and departed. When I got back up, Bruce told me, he says, George, he says, what you did was something fantastic. I says, no, I says, it wasn't fantastic. It's something anybody would do. My memory fades only because I worked it, getting rid of it. I did not want to remember all the things that happened, particularly when I was in Korea. One of the funnier things, I was brought up with five girls at home. I knew nothing about fighting. Consequently, when I got into, I guess it was second or third grade, this young man just kicked my butt. Every day on the way home from school, I got a whipping. Years passed. I no longer thought about it. I got an R&R, &R and I went to Japan. I was sitting there drinking a beer. All of a sudden, this young army troop come in. This guy looks kind of familiar. No, couldn't be. Yeah, yeah, that's him. And he got up from where he was sitting, came to my table, leaned across it, and asked me why I'm looking at him. I just feel like looking at you. He said, well, you better cut it out or we're gonna have to do something about it. Pretty soon we started fisticuffs. His name was also George. I says, George, I says, I remember you when we was in school. Says, what do you mean? I says, you used to whip my butt every evening after school. He stopped, thought about it a minute. 
said, no, he said, you're not. I said, yes, I am. We finished fighting. The MPs came. They were going to carry us both off to jail. And of course, I asked Mama San, I says, how much is the charge? So I gave her $200 and I asked her if that was enough. She said, oh, yes, oh, yes. Turned out that George and I had a fantastic time for the rest of my R&R. &R. Everything goes around, comes around. Was a combat medic for approximately four months. Got wounded twice. Well, the head doctor said, two wounds is enough, three strikes and you're out. So they sent me next door to the Signal Corps unit, and I spent the remainder of the time climbing telephone poles to get communications from the 38th parallel back to headquarters in Seoul. I was terrified the whole time and don't remember much of anything. When I got there, I became the loader. I'd never seen a tank before. And then uh, after two missions, I became the gunner. And after a couple of more missions, I became the tank commander. People were dropping rather quickly. I was drafted. At that time, there was some discussion in Congress whether they would do the GI Bill restricted to the Korean conflict. Then I got my orders to go to Europe. And so I told the sergeant, I reject this and need to uh, volunteer to go to Korea. The country I saw was very um, devastated and uh, very poor. The Korean people we met were always very gentle, very, very cooperative with us when we were there. When we landed there, the guy there wanted to just move us out of the way. 5,000 guys coming out of the ship during monsoon season. And I went to this uh, company and I walked in there. Uh, the sergeant was there and he was typing with one finger. Uh, and it, they looked at me and said, can you type? And I said, well, yes. And he said, he took the typewriter and said, this is yours. I never forgot his expression. He sat down and started to twiggle his fingers and said, this life is good. And so I ended up being a company clerk, kept me out of the foxholes while I was in Korea, you know. And that's it. That's, that's my good story for Korea. I enlisted in the Air Force to, to stay out of the Army, so I wouldn't get drafted. But I still wound up in Vietnam when we got sent on a unit called Big Guy Task Force. At that time, it was called Airborne Early Warning, and we were under NORAD. See, we would fly on a plane for about 15 hours, so we were way up there above the 17th parallel. The Marines would not go across the 17th parallel, but we were flying about 50 feet above the water. Because if you fly any higher, the surface-to-air missiles would shoot you down. The F-4s, the jet fighters, and the F-105s would drop their loads over Hanoi. The MiGs would go up there and dogfight. So our job was to tell them, hey, you got a MiG at uh, 10,000 feet. He's at uh, 090 degrees. You know, be on the lookout. That was our job to take care of our, our fighters. Our air aircraft commander, and he was a good guy. And um, when he didn't take his drink, he was nervous. And when we landed, the, the plane would pow, hit the runway and we would bounce, pow, 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 pow. bad landing. But when he had his drink, he was cool and we had a, the landing was smooth. And you could have had a cup of coffee in your hand and it wouldn't spill. And every time we turned, one of the wings almost hit the water, you know? But he knew what he was doing. Most of us were young. We did not know what danger we were in until we came back. And then you get older and say, what the hell was I doing? I got to see a couple of Bob Hope shows. He had Raquel Welch with her. And then, but it was, it was hilarious. And suddenly I got my drug dose. I was barely 18, 18 and a half. Landed inside Army when they were 
firing on the airbase, the landing strip. So the pilot told us, well, we're gonna turn on all the lights off on the airplane and just land with the lights on the landing. And you could hear the rounds just going off everywhere. And a lot of guys that were in Vietnam, we know that was a totally different conflict, especially what was going on here in the country, our own country. When I came home, I tell you what, I wanted to go back to Vietnam. I'm not kidding. But anyways, I love I love this country, and I'll fight for it anytime, any day. They said, "Don't wear your uniform when you on your flight home." I didn't wear it. We landed in San Francisco. First thing they, I heard on the intercom was my name, and then they said, "Well, you're gonna have to get off the plane. You're not getting on the plane because." We have a customer that's paying full fare. You gotta wait. And you know, that's uh, that's the things that really made it bad for the Vietnam veterans coming home. Hopefully that will never happen to another generation of warriors. I remember when my wife went out and bought a the game of Pac-Man. And I tell you what, I tell you one time, I had nightmares for six months. I kept, you know, I, those little things. I, I was grimming ambushes. Uh, you know, over the years, uh, I've been asked by several of the, the youngsters that are going into the military, what, what's one thing that you would advise me to do? And I've always told them, keep a sense of humor, otherwise it'll drive you crazy. A friend of mine and I were sent down to uh, headquarters to pick up a couple of armored personnel gear, and, and uh, they weren't ready yet. And of course, the GIs with nothing to do head for the beer hall. A friend of mine decided it would be fun to shoot a burst of M16 rounds above their heads and see what the headquarters guys did. So they, they were kind of known for not ever seeing any uh, any action. And I grabbed it and looked at it, and I reached over and pulled the fire can out. He kept we pulled the trigger, nothing happened. He jacked it on the floor and pulled the trigger, nothing happened. He finally figured out what I had done when I picked up that rifle. <laughs> and he started chasing me around. We went around and around. Fortunately, I could outrun him, so he was. <laughs> but, uh, just silly things like that is where you got to keep the sense of humor. Is, uh... I enlisted in 1964, right out of high school. I was sent to Vietnam with the 9th CB Battalion. The CBs are involved with uh, construction in combat areas, basically like building landing strips and firing bases and that kind of thing. What we do is we're, we're able to, to defend whatever it is that we're working on and usually we'll end up in pretty uh, isolated places. We were involved in, in several major battles. My unit was involved in one big uh, battle. We had 80 wounded in one day, which was really rough including myself. I'm proud of what I did. I'd probably do it all over again if I had to. When, uh, when we returned, there was a lot of, uh, of anti-Vietnam feeling, I guess. Not, I know a lot of guys 